Dr. Ricky McCormick. I own a training and consulting company, which is kind of how I'm, I'm here now. Uh, my background and where I first met Macy, um, my most recent position was as the Director of Special Education and Student Support Services for Lincoln County Schools. And we talk a lot about West Virginia being ground zero for the opioid epidemic and what happens as consequences to the opioid epidemic. But Lincoln County is the true ground zero of the opioid epidemic. Uh, Lincoln County has the highest mass rate per capita in the nation at 106 for every 1,000 live births. Those babies are born dependent to drugs. The oldest child in Lincoln County schools that has a diagnosis of mass is a 20 year old ultimate diploma senior. So Lincoln County, this is nothing new for them with having severe behaviors influenced by the drug epidemic. It's been something that they have handled for 20 years. When I arrived in Lincoln County in 2015, their special education rate was at 25%. Their suspension rate for students with disabilities and without disabilities um, was substantial with over 2,000 days of suspension in their high school alone. Um, and their achievement rate was not anything anyone would want to look at. From the time we implemented these practices, including the use of calming spaces, from 2016 till my departure in 2021, we saw the special education identification rate go from 25 to about 20.2%, while at the same time the state rate went from 14 to 17%. We saw our identification rate for autism go down specifically and maintain on the national average. And our discipline rate, specifically at our high school, was cut in two thirds. We had an increase of kids being involved in CTE programs and started the first program in the state that had a simulated workplace with an open restaurant in the high school for kids with severe cognitive disabilities with also severe behavioral disorders. And they partnered together. So it was really neat to see kids that have severe behavior disorders be partnered up with kids with severe cognitive disabilities and have a workplace um, that was successful. So what we're gonna talk about, and we're keying in on the idea of calming spaces today, is that I'm not gonna sell you a program, and I'm not gonna sell you a magic bullet. What I'm gonna talk about is how everything works together and the key of everything is adult behavior and then self-regulation. Because until we fix adult behavior and we have opportunities for self-regulation, nothing else can happen. So we have this idea of Maslow's before Bloom's. And about three years ago, no one would think of that. Like that wasn't a, a title or, or a phrase that people heard. But we're now starting to get it because before, you know, you've had people that never experienced trauma or experience the effect trauma had on the brain. But after COVID-19 and, and the trauma that comes from a global wide pandemic, everybody knows what trauma feels like. So right now, there are a lot of adults going, I can't, I can't pin down why I feel this way. Nothing is really going differently than it's been going for the last 18 months. And it's called surge fatigue. So your, your body is designed to fight or flight for a little amount of time. You've now been in fight or flight for nearly 24 months. Your body's not designed for that. So I'm gonna take a wild guess that if anything goes wrong, like McDonald's like forgets to give you a straw or your sweet and sour sauce for your nuggets, you were just, you're done. The day is done. When before, you go, well, five minutes, I'll be home, I'll have a straw, okay? And so you're starting to experience then what these kids have always experienced. But you have fully developed brains, you're college educated, you have a support system of some kind, and these kids don't. And so that idea of changing that adult behavior starts with knowledge and perspective and acceptance, and then understanding what can we do to promote self-regulation? Because if we can get through self-regulation, we can get back to learning. So throughout this presentation, I'm gonna reference one of two things. It's either going to be the work done in Lincoln County which I was a hands-on director. A week did not go by that I was not in schools, I was not teaching classes, I was not working one-on-one -on -one with students. Every single week, I was out of my schools because the only way that I could be relevant and to my, for my teachers to trust what I was gonna tell them 
is for them to see it in action. So you're either going to hear stories or examples from Lincoln County, or you're going to see them that I want to reflect out of my own life. I'm a single mom of four. Three of them I biologically own. One is adopted out of the foster care system. She came to me when she was seven, and she is now 13. But when, when I talk about self-regulation strategies, I was put to the test for seven, eight, and nine um, of her life. And so I see it work as a mom, I've seen it work as a director, I've seen it work as a practitioner or a teacher of students. Also, at any point in time, you can go, I don't think that that can work. Or I need you to explain that. Or I call something. And we'll have a conversation. Because what I want out of here is for you to take this and go, how can I make this work with my teachers, my staff, and my students? If you leave out of here with questions, I didn't do my job. So don't ever hesitate to just go, hey, hey you. And we can stop, talk about that, find a solution, especially if you're going, I'm thinking of an individual kid and we've done this, 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 and this. I don't see how this will work. Where can I start, okay? So this entire story actually starts in Lewisburg. Funny enough, um, it starts in April 2016. At that point in time, um, I was nicknamed kind of like the Pollyanna. Um, Kat Homburg was the director of special education for the state of West Virginia. She had been my director of Putnam County um, when I was a new teacher. She had been my college professor. Like I, 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 I will do what Pat says, and, and she used me as an example. Of, I was this wide-eyed Pollyanna. I was the youngest special education director in the state. Um, and the one that they could ever remember being in charge of anything. Um, and I just had this wide-eyed idea that I could make things better. And for the first six months, all I did was not even put out fires, just kind of build a barrier around them and try to make them not go any farther, okay? There, I had no clue actually how to put these fires out or make anything better. And I intercepted a flyer that was meant for our PK coordinator um, about a conference that was being hosted by the FRN here in Greenbrier County, um, and it was being held at the church down the street. It had a registration fee of like $25, and I possibly just talked my superintendent into letting me go. And that conference changed my philosophy and my practice. Because for the entire time I had been a director, which was about eight months at that time, I knew that I wasn't getting something. I didn't understand why I had come from Putnam County, which at the time had the highest um, test scores in the state, with a special education rate hovering around 11%, coming into Lincoln County that had some of the worst scores in the state, with a special education rate of 25%, when I really couldn't see any difference in the classroom. I would go in there and I'm like, oh, I just saw that lesson in Putnam County. What I saw teachers do. Why do I have such a difference? What what is going on? And these kids aren't responding to what I saw respond in Putnam County. There has to be a reason, and I can figure it out. So there were two things that I was introduced to at this conference here in Lewisburg. The first one was the ACE study done by the CDC and Kaiser Permanent Bank. Although at that point in time, that study was nearly 15 years old. I had never heard about it before. And that shocked me. Why in the world would a study that shows experiences that happen to children that have a lifelong effect to their decision and their health not be at the forefront of every education program in this country? It did not make sense to me. Now guys, we've had ACES training. Do you guys remember what that is? Or do you want her to talk about that a little bit? Raise your hand if you remember what the ACE is. Yes. We'll go over it. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. So in the late 90s, the CDC and Kaiser Permanente did a longitudinal study of over 17,000 adults of their experiences as children to health outcomes. There were 10 categories. It, it covered abuse, neglect, and household situations like incarceration, mental illness of parents, um, lack of, of food or being or medical care, physical abuse and neglect, sexual abuse, 
emotional neglect. And there were 10 questions. And, and the question, like physical abuse says, have you repeatedly, often, or ever been hit, threatened to be hit, hit, punched with a, with a fist by an adult or a parent in the household? That is a spectrum question, isn't it? And there were 10 questions like that. And what they found is that first, ACEs are extremely common. That nearly one third of the population had experienced at least one ACE. But what they found was number three was the tipping point. From zero to three ACEs, they did not see a significant difference in health outcomes. But once somebody hit four ACEs, their health outcomes changed dramatically. They were more likely to develop COPD, they were more likely to develop hepatitis, they were more likely to suffer cardiovascular disease. They were 1,200% more likely to take their own life. And it was directly related to those experiences because three-fourths of them were white, three-fourths of them were college educated. So the population wasn't the idea of that happens in those neighborhoods with those families. No, it happened in our neighborhoods with our families. And even if they took out outcomes that had a direct correlation to behaviors, because they were more likely to engage in high risk behaviors with food, alcohol, drugs, and sex, if they even took those outcomes out of the way, they were more likely to develop cancers that had zero connection to behavioral outcomes. So the first thing I learned was this study told me that based on what happened to you as a child, you were more likely to act, behave, and cope in certain ways, and it impacted your health. I had two colleagues with me. And what was odd about the two colleagues that went with me is we grew up very differently. I grew up in a brick rancher with two parents that were college professors that took me to church three times a week, and I had a certain regimented schedule in which my sister then was valedictorian, my brother's an all-state football player, very much a middle class, white family in West Virginia. One of my colleagues <clears throat> had a broken home, suffered abuse that was put on the news, um, already had two failed marriages, and had two different kids. My other colleague, her dad was a bank manager, her mom suffered from severe mental illness, was a hospitalized schizophrenic, still remained in the hospital under state's custody. And at that moment, in which we learned about the ACE study, because we had connected, like we just got each other. We knew how each other was gonna to respond to things, we knew how we were gonna to respond to kids. And I looked at my left and I looked to my right and I was like, I'll tell you my ACE score if you tell me yours. Because this, this was really shocking to me that this could be that way. And we all had the same ACE score, which was more than four. We have very different backgrounds, but we had similar ACE scores. We then, as adults, looked at life differently than our peers. We acted differently than our peers. But it's why we just understood these kids that no one else seemed to understand. Now note, I told you that I had two parents that were college professors, grew up in a brick rancher. My ACE score had literally zero to do with anything my parents could control. I had an ACE score point because my parent, one of my parents suffered from mental illness. That was treatable. That doesn't change what happened before it was treated. I had an ACE score point over a sexual abuse question because that question says, an adult in a household or anyone five years older than you up to the age 18. And the fact is, is that at least one in three women that you will ever meet will have sexual assault in their lifetime. Guess what? That's almost a guaranteed ACE for any child that you have that is female. And so having different backgrounds, we have the same ACE score, we approach kids the same way. And that was the first light bulb moment that we had, that these kids that no one is reaching, that are having these behaviors, I want to know what's going on in their past. I want to know what they experienced. So when we returned back to our office, 
I told three files of the kids that I got calls on every week. And based solely on the information in their special education file, so birth to three records, parent observations, interviews, all of those kids had at least an ACE score of five, just based on what I could see within their special education file. So I wasn't looking at autism, I wasn't looking at ADHD, I wasn't looking at a specific learning disability that was given to them as a label. I was looking at a kid whose brain had been physiologically changed by trauma. And that's why nothing was working. Because I was using strategies, or telling my teachers to use strategies, that are proven strategies, but not for the right thing. It's kind of like if you go to the doctor because you have a gallbladder attack, and they tell you to take Tylenol, that's not gonna work. It's probably gonna make it worse. But if you go, and you have a headache, and they give you Tylenol, it might help, right? Tylenol is not bad. Tylenol is a proven strategy. It can help, but only if it's treating the right cause. And that's what was going on with these kids. We weren't treating the right cause. And then the second light bulb moment, because after the ACE study, they introduced a study that was going on in California about the over-identification of students with special education, specifically with ADHD and autism, that when they went back and looked at their ACE scores, what they really had was trauma. And then they changed their therapeutic approach and magically things happened. They had seen a, like a positive increase after a child was first diagnosed with either ADHD or autism. They treated them like they always did. They saw a steady amount of progress and then they plateaued and then they would fall off. Why? Because they weren't treating the right thing like we talked about with Tylenol. So at that moment when I realized what I thought was going on to our 25% of special education, as well as the phone that was ringing off the hook for behaviors, is that we were just approaching this in the wrong way. That we were treating what we were still treating from 1970 with proven research strategies of what you do with children with learning disabilities. And we needed to think about what can I do if a child has been exposed to trauma? And in 2016, there wasn't a lot social emotional learning like you Google that and nothing comes up. You would look for trauma-informed care, nothing comes up. So we had to figure things out on our own and break down what did we know, what could we find, and how would that then change our practice in the school system. So think of an octopus. We looked at this from all sides. The center of our octopus was kids have been exposed to trauma. We have to change the way that we're working with them. So what are the things that I can do? And what I know I can do is change adults. Because the only behavior I can control is myself. So I certainly can't change a child just because I want to. I have to start with adult behavior, adult perceptions, and adult ideas. So we went at it from a multiple of angles. The first thing that we did was that there was also not a SAC process when I got into the county. So we first implemented the SAC process. Kind of have too many moves. But we implemented it. But we also, when we trained, we talked about that the SAC process was for any child facing difficulty, whether that was academic, behavioral, emotional, mental, or environmental, that the SAC team was the center of our ability to process help for these kids because you needed an identified disability or a suspect of a disability for a 504. You had to fit in one of the 14 eligibility categories for an IEP, and making a round peg fit in a square hole wasn't working. So how do we use the policies that are already there so that we can help kids? And the SAC team was designed to promote success for children no matter the cause, so we used it. Every time we had a situation that we needed to face, we went back to the SAT team. We established who would be on that SAT team, who provided consistency, and then we ensured that whatever we needed to meet that need, it would happen. So for example, we had a school that we had a large foster population that still came to school with dirty clothes. And the reason that they came to school with dirty clothes is because they refused to shower at the home that they were at based on previous foster homes that they had been in, and that 
created problems with other students within the classroom and they weren't ready to learn. So part of our SAT plan was we had a washer, a dryer, and a shower. And so they arrived at a certain time and they spent their homeroom time. They could wash their own clothes, take a shower, and they would have clothes that then they could change into. And amazingly enough, they started to decrease the behaviors in the classroom because it was clean. We also decided that no one was going to be the gatekeeper of knowledge, that everyone was going to have access to all the knowledge that we could have. And so West Virginia is Microsoft 365, so we created a one notebook of trauma resources. Everything from the A study being linked to the CDC and Kaiser Permanente and the TED Talk from Dr. Mady and Burke Harris, to the foster care episode from Sesame Street, to other books that they either could pull from our office or use their faculty senate money for, research and articles that continued to be prevalent, we would categorize and they always had access to it. At no point in time did somebody just go, you don't need to know that. That information was always readily available, always readily to be accessed, and then every single year we had a trauma training for new hires. So everybody that was a new hire, from a custodian up to a director, came in for a trauma training to understand what our position, vision, philosophy, and actions were going to be. And it was very clear. We, you control your behavior. I can't. You can. And if you don't control your behavior, your world's probably not going to go real well for you. We're, we're just looking at If it does, you're going to be successful. We also listen to our staff. One of the things that we heard time and time again from older teachers was that I'm not certified to help out with anything going on in their head. I'm certified in math. I'm certified in science. That's it. Fair. So, use mental health first aid. I can certify you in being that stop the gap measure of understanding how to triage and get help the same way American Red Cross does first aid. Go over there, hey, hey, are you okay? Hey, you, call 911. I'm gonna check to see if you're breathing. Same process for kids and teens and mental health crisis. And so we offer that continually. If you felt that you could not do it because you didn't have a certification, then you came to Youth Mental Health First Aid because then you got a certification that you could print off and put right beside your teacher certificate. <laughs> We also looked at the fact that when West Virginia started RTI back in 2007, the original code was written for reading, math, and behavior. And even though all the money and all the coaching went away, that part didn't change. So how do I make my peer interventions incorporate behavior? Focusing on literacy is not enough. Focusing on mathematics is not enough. I need to incorporate behavior. And so we had MTSS, trainings, we would sit down and set up schedules, and then we'd specifically talk about what it looked like for universal targeted and intensive interventions for children when it comes to behavior. And for tier two interventions, we specifically chose Journey of Hope. That came from the 100-year-old flood, okay? That took out Herbert Hoover High School, but Herbert Hoover still doesn't have high school. Um, Save the Children came in and set up this kind of collaborative effort to work with children that were facing trauma from a community event. Um, and the program is called Journey of Hope. And it specifically targets grief, its process, and how to overcome to self-regulate. So that became our tier two intervention. We brought them in, they, we did train the trainer models so that we had multiple train the trainers throughout the county. And then we had teams set up in each school then would facilitate these tier two interventions. Why did we do that? Because no matter what A score they had, it centers on grief. If you are physically, mentally, emotionally, sexually abused, they took something from you. If you are physically um, or emotionally neglected, they took something from you. If you lost your parents to divorce, separation, or death, something was taken from you and it centers on grief. And we forget that children and ourselves are not inherently resilient. You have to grieve. 
And if you don't grieve, you are stuck in the same place as where you were when it happened. It just looks differently. So Journey of Hope centers on that grief process and how to process, and so that became the Tier 2 intervention. We also then used the opportunity from the State Department of Ed where they allowed pretty much the county to just take positions to be CPI certified and heavily used that to have trainers in every school so that every staff member would be trained in de-escalation every single year. I remember the first time I ever got that blue card for CPI and it was called passive restraint training and all we really did was holes. So it was kind of amazing to me as I grew that that was really never the intentional design. The intentional design of CPI was always de-escalation first because you control your behavior and your behavior will either light that match or help to fizzle it. And so we had trainers in every school that then de-escalation training or that day one training was mandatory every single year. You then had teams that understood restraint and understood the proper times of restraint, but when we were utilizing calming spaces, our number of restraints decreased dramatically. In the last year I was in Lincoln County, I had two restraints from the same school with the same administration that just wanted to make kids behave. I said, you realize you're the only ones that still have restraints, right? Like all my other schools, have zero. All my other schools have calming spaces. You refuse to give me a space. You refuse to support the de-escalation strategies. You have created the situation, not your kids. Because every other school has zero. And then we use advanced physical holds to have a county crisis team and the idea of a severe crisis. Never had to use and then we had a county trauma team. And that county trauma team was designed to continue to reflect, revise, and plan for better opportunities for that county. And we used the Handle with Care Conference to center that vision to know new and upcoming research and to create that plan for the coming year. So the first year that the Handle with Care Conference existed was the first year that we went. And I, we just took volunteers, like who is willing to go? And some of those people stuck around and some of them didn't. Some of them were like, I'm out, this is too much. And that's okay. Year two, our school representatives were the ones that made up our county trauma team that ended up leading the trauma team at each of their school. Year three, we had an invited presentation and then year four and five, obviously COVID threw a wrench with everybody. But we used that because Andrea Dar from the Department of Children's Justice with the Handle with Care Protocol, that truly centered our consistency of care with a reminder that we're in this together. And she does a phenomenal job going across the nation, getting people that are doing this work every day and how each of these pieces continue to influence how you can respond in schools. So the Handle with Care Conference this year is also, also virtual. And I was in a presentation yesterday specifically about human trafficking. Why? Because West Virginia is growing in leaps and bounds the numbers of human trafficking that is occurring. And the majority of the trafficking that is occurring in West Virginia is familial trafficking. And it's happening outside their family. It's harder to see and it's harder to notice. I had a case with a child three years ago. He was a PK kid of ours. And the list of difficulties we had filled up a page. His IEP was probably about 20 pages long by the time we were done. For every issue we had, we had a strategy with steps and contingency plans. We seemed to make zero progress. Then my phone goes off one morning with turn on the news. And his dad was being arrested. He was taken into care. The issue was he was being trafficked by his father. It had nothing to do with the strategies we were doing. It had everything to do with we didn't know enough. And so if you want to talk about somebody who failed a child that day, I failed a child that day. And I went, we have to continue to grow and know because we're behind. 
as far as we get, we're still behind. And we've got to be better humans. And so we started going, all right, how do we get human trafficking training? Because it's happening, and it's happening right here. So there's never a point of stopping. It's always a point of growing, and what do we need to go next? Now, we don't, we don't look about human trafficking until I understand my own behavior, but I understood that there was a process that we had to have. In everything that we do, I kept an 80-10 thing principle. There are some people that are going to do what you ask them to do simply because you ask them to do it, okay? They're about 10% of your population. There are going to be people that are never going to do what you ask them to do simply because you ask them to do it. They would have a rotary phone if it was still possible just to not have a cell phone. <laughs> and 80% of your people are going to go where you spend time, <clears throat> except that we typically spend time with the 10% that are never going to budge. And so that 80 comes over here to that 10, and all of a sudden you've got 90, and nothing works. Okay, I got 10% that's gonna go. And so my time and my effort is gonna come over here to that 10%, and then that 80% comes over here, where my time and my effort is spent. And so then I've got 90% of my adults on board and that 10% either shut up or get out. And that's fine with me. Because 90% are gonna do the right thing. And if I've got 90%, then I've got change. We had to recognize certain things about human behavior. Okay, so when we first did ACES training, it was not done by me. We hired in a consultant. Jesus had to believe in that So I couldn't do it. And that was okay. I had to understand elements of human behavior and elements of change. When you ask somebody to change, the first thing that they have to accept is that you're not telling them they're wrong. Sometimes you are, but not usually. When we know better, we do better. But usually, someone else has to hear from somebody else why we need to do better. That doesn't mean you're not a good leader. It means they have to accept they've got to do things differently, and that even though it wasn't wrong, it's not right right now. And that's hard to take from your leader. So we would go outside and bring people in. From that, we looked at, we focused really in on the science of the brain. One of the first things that we would hear about is, they will not communicate with me. What if I told you the child's not communicating with you because he can't? Not that he won't, but he can't. So we have two parts of our brain. Okay, we've heard it about like our thinking brain and our feeling brain, our upstairs brain and our downstairs brain, our developed brain, our reptilian brain. Guess what? That exists. And if you think about the hand model, okay, and that idea of flipping your lid, okay, who has heard the term flip your lid? Oh my who cares? Okay. <laughs> So there is, this, there is a scientific principle about flipping your lid, okay? So if you have your hand, okay, this is your brain. And when everything is calm and good, your brain can connect to your language center, okay? So your prefrontal cortex can connect to your language center, okay? That's the top of your hand, that's your language part, it connects. Except when my fight or flight response gets triggered, okay, I need my primitive brain to take over, which means my lid flips. I no longer can speak to you about what's going on because my prefrontal cortex is disconnected from the language part of my brain. My brain stem then is in control. So until I can calm and self-regulate and bring that back down, I cannot communicate with you. Not that I don't want to, I can't. And so when we explain the science of the brain, and that your fight or flight response is triggered, like subconsciously, you don't have control over it, there's that first understanding of, then what do I do to get them back to be able to communicate? Good. And when we're at that point, then we can make better decisions because as adults, the only person that we can control is ourselves. The training that we did with the outside 
consultant came in and she trained our core team. She also then made the plug for it to be a collaborative effort. So at that point in time, I told you I was a white eye Pollyanna, I was also kind of shoved to the side at times. Like, that's just Ricky. Like, we just let her do her thing. We just, she's over here. Except when the outside consultant came in and, and said the same thing I was saying, but in a much different way. Our federal program director went, so this really needs to be an everybody thing and not just a students with disabilities thing. So like, bingo. And so he took the lead in then making that a general education thing. And he presented to the board um, several times about what we were doing and he always made it kosher with them. Okay, because we still have to remember that West Virginia is completely inlaid in Appalachia. You still have perspectives and paradigms you are not going to change and you have to use language that is not going to make people recoil. That was his job, not mine. Not looking at it. And so when we first started talking about how we were going to take class time to center ourselves and self-regulate, he coined a personal prep education and did a great presentation so that then the board just went, oh, Ricky doing that kind of stuff. That's great. Okay. So knowing your audience and knowing how to keep that going so you don't have to hurdle jump was the next thing that we focused on. And we decided that the biggest thing that we needed to do was build capacity within our classrooms, okay? For a couple of reasons. One, we had tons of people in positions of long-term subs. We were already instituting an alternative certification program because we couldn't get certified teachers. It's not like I can just open a position up and bring them in. There's nobody to hire, even if I could. So how do I build capacity? I need my teachers and my staff, everyone from my bus drivers, to my cooks, to my aides, to understand where we're going to be and that if we're all on the same page, or at least 90% of us, your job's gonna be easier and not harder. And in doing that, we've talked about continually building your toolbox. And sometimes those were strategies and sometimes those were things that we gave them and taught them how to use. And they never left a training, a five minute takeaway, an in-service at the school if we taught them how to use something without having it. So if we taught them how to use fidgets in their classrooms appropriately, they left with fidget boxes. So I couldn't raise their salary, but I could support what I needed them to do. And so they knew every time they came in, that's what they were going to get. So things that we did to build that capacity, one was the use of fidgets. And the example that I used was that my children did not go to the school in the district in which I worked. And I gave the example of the fact that I had four children at the time with IEPs, and one of them more intensive than the other. She was the smartest with the most issues. And I had a fidget for her that I had gotten at a conference that worked really well for her. And although she was in middle school, fine with me, and it would stick on her notebook. And I had to have a two hour IEP meeting to argue the use of the fidget that they didn't buy. Why? Well, other kids want to, then give them to them. I don't care. <laughs> Teach them how to use it. If they need it, they'll use it. If they don't, they'll cease to use it. And so when we talked about fidgets, we talked about why make things more difficult if it helps. We talked about consistency in using fidgets, how you set up fidget norms inside your classroom, how you're consistent with them. And if you can, can hold the course for two weeks, kids are gonna self-regulate themselves in the use or not use of fidgets, okay? Two weeks, it's a novelty. Get past the two weeks and you're consistent, only the kids that need it will use it. And every teacher that took me for that and did those two weeks, they were like, that's amazing. It's the behavior. Behavior is predictable. You just have to know how to stay the course. Baby dolls. Baby dolls were present from PK through second grade and then all of our counseling and social work. Why? Because if you hold a baby doll, you automatically cuddle it. And within three minutes, your shoulders start to drop, you inhale better, and it's this inherent psychological thing that we do when we have baby dolls. And my best story was my high school counselor who said, I need more baby dolls. And I said, what? 
I said, you have like three. And she was like, look, like I have kids that come in and I can tell they've been sent out of class. They come in, they sit, they tell me they don't want to talk. They look at my bucket, they pick up the baby doll, and within four minutes, they're then telling me what's going on. Because holding that baby doll helped them self-regulate. I was like, all right, I'll get you more baby dolls. Okay. Now, there is a, a concept called baby doll therapy by Dr. Becky Bailey that was done specifically with research for re reactive attachment disorder. And so if you want to look that up, that is a specific thread of research. And although we didn't use baby dolls in the specific way that baby doll therapy is coined, the idea of using baby dolls for self-regulation just works. We also talked about using books all of the time. So one of the things we had to make sure that people understood is that we don't want to take time away from your content. We want to teach you how to embed content with this idea of social emotional learning, but at the same time, the more that you can grow that relationship piece and that understanding of connecting things outside of themselves, the better your other content's gonna be. And so we talked about using books, okay, and that idea of bibliotherapy. And we had books across the topics. Um, Lincoln County had a high foster care population, and so we had books in every single school about different families and foster care. And so that if they got a new student, no matter what their age, they could use those books to get people on the same page that families look different, but families are not necessarily blood relatives, and that's okay. If we found a new book, I would order one. I would see if it's, the purpose would be what we needed, and then we would share that out. We made books available in classroom libraries for kids to see things like themselves. So we had books with parents that didn't look like that traditional mom and dad family. We had books about grandparents. We had books about foster care. We had books about adoption. We had books about different scenarios in middle school and high school to start having those harder conversations because they have to see what they're seeing and see an outcome and have conversations. We also used puppets. Um, especially in our younger grades, because we want to explicitly teach behavior. You don't teach behavior in the moment. You teach behavior outside of the moment. And so in teaching behavior, we would use like Tommy the turtle, or we would use a dragon and talk about when do we feel that way and when do we blow fire and how do we, what happens if we blow fire when we're angry? And we talk about how that can scorch things. And then what does that look like for us? What are ways that maybe we can blow fire where it doesn't hurt people? And when you have those continual conversations, you can also cue children, and then you can also then revisit that if there still is an explosive behavior. We use writing prompts all the time. Okay, so we use emoji cubes, send away cubes, really enforcing this idea of writing. Now, one of my big writing pieces is I love the University of Kansas writing strategy specifically sentence writing and paragraph writing. It's my favorite, okay? I used it in my social education classrooms all the time. It was the most straightforward way I could teach kids how to write, okay? And when we, that was one of our big pushes. And one of the things in the sentence writing strategy is every third day, they write sentences, okay? It starts out pretty straightforward, subject, verb. It goes to complex sentences. But then our topics always centered around emotion thoughts, feelings. Why? Because when a kid has a behavior, what, even if you go, you know, how do you feel instead of why did you do that? Okay, if you say how do you feel, you get I don't know. We don't teach them how to use language to express how we feel, and that is not something they're automatically going to learn. Even as adults. Have you ever asked an adult, like, what's in your head? Why did why, you do that? How are you feeling? And they're like, I don't know. Because they don't have the language to express how they feel. Because they've never been taught. So the idea of writing and that idea of language is not inherent to how our brains are, are, are created. Okay? So the, the science of reading is a term where people are trying to break down 
um, how neuro like neuro pathways are created to teach kids how to read and why there's a gap. And one of the things that they found is that our brains are still not wired to read and write. It's a skill. Like it's an explicit skill that you are not going to just pick up. So if we understand that with the basic idea of writing, then why do we think that they can just tell us how they feel when they've not been taught how to tell us how they feel? And so we would use writing prompts continually to practice writing how you feel, expanding on that, using situational exercises so that if we practice and practice and practice expressing how we feel, then when it matters, I can tell you how I feel. One of the ideas is um, an idea of a worry muncher or clear the air or an I can't funeral or a bag. And the one that's kind of circulating on social media right now is a bag in which people like write down their problems, crumple it up, and they toss it in the bag when they come into the classroom. You know, I gotta leave my worries there when I come in. And if that is a practice, it becomes real. So um, I, I told you I was a single mom of four. And when I like officially became a single mom, um, it was a big struggle for my kids because their dad was mentally ill and there was a big, big issue, okay? And they weren't sure really how to process who they could talk to, who they could trust. And so these worry munchers, which are stuffed animals with zipper mounts, um, I found some at TJ Maxx, because I'm obviously not going to take them from work, and I brought them home. And I said, I know you guys are really struggling um, and you don't want to talk to me, but I can tell you're upset, like you're just upset. So if you want to write, if you want to draw a picture, if you put something in this worry muncher, I'm not going to look at it. It is for you to be able to put how you feel and, and know that someone else can take care of it. About six months later, I'm cleaning my middle child's room, and that's a mess in and of itself. And I find this worry muncher kind of underneath her mattress. I just thought that, like what I said, what I wasn't going to look at it. It was six months, so I could totally look at it. <laughs> um, and I opened it up and I pulled it out, and I pulled out no less than 20 scraps of paper. And some of them had drawings, and some of them had words, and it was literally her putting out her feelings and sticking them somewhere else. And when I started to think back, I was like, I started to see a change. It never had to be a conversation. It was just something that she knew that she could do. I'm a big proponent of board games. And as a teacher, I had board game Fridays. Why? Because it teaches you the top 10 skills that employers want you to know, because none of that has to do with content. There are things like communication, negotiation, um, collaboration, problem solving, critical thinking. And no, many families play board games or card games anymore. And I could get board games that also had content embedded in them. You know, Monopoly does that. It has risk taking, it's middle math, it's reading. It's predicting. And so using board games to reinforce these skills, also allowing for conflict resolution, is something that we really pushed. And what was really then cool on the back side is when you find teachers that had done that for several months, and they come back and be like, the kids asked for it, but have also noticed that they can resolve their conflicts. They are reading directions now. I don't have to hound them to read directions. They're just getting it. Yoga, as well as um, just breathing. We really pushed that within all the classrooms and told them if you take five minutes to do yoga and breathing at the beginning of your class, write it in your lesson plans. You're never going to get in trouble. We gave them permission to do those things. And then we continued to talk about how can we display emotion and have conversations about emotion so that this is something that they just do rather than when they're in trouble. And the more that we built that capacity, the more that we saw those behaviors decrease, the more that they were able to spend time on task learning because they were meeting their social and emotional needs first. Everything came back to strategic planning. So everything that we did we looked at data, we looked at revising, we would reflect, make changes, and then create more plans. It was a continual process. One of the things that we knew is that we still weren't meeting
feeding kids' needs when they went home, and Mondays were still a big discipline day. For the most part, during the week, we were doing pretty well. But when they come back from break, and when they came back from the weekend, that was the day that we had more discipline issues than any other day of the week. Okay? What can we do? What can we do to meet the needs? What are they not getting on the weekend? What can we provide? And so we would have a clothing and food pantry out of this central office that our high school kids with severe cognitive disabilities worked as a workplace that we created backpacks um, that had food, hygiene products, um, clothes if needed, activities. And that was something that we did every single week. If we were consistent with providing that, we saw those behaviors start to decrease. Why? Because then they weren't coming to school Monday morning hungry and waiting on grab and go. They did have food then throughout the weekend. We talk about putting adults in the shoes of the students. And so one of my favorite activities is when I would take our high school and I would get two buses because there were kind of two geographical halves of the county. You had Route 3 and Route 10, but very, very few kids actually live on Route 3 and Route 10. And so I would put all the history and English teachers on one bus. I would put the math and science teachers on the other bus. When we got going, I would hand them a worksheet of approximately 10th grade level of the opposite to them. So like the math and science teachers got like an English worksheet and the history and reading teachers or English teachers got a math worksheet, okay? And they're like, well, I don't have a pencil. Why not? This is not. I'm a math teacher. Don't you need to be well-rounded? And more than once, as they're trying to at least look at it, we have had to pull over and let people get off because they're sick, like they get cars. Because we take them out the actual routes. Like I said, they drive Route 3 and Route 10, but they don't drive out to where the children actually live. And so they need that experience of, you can't tell them to do their homework on the bus. It doesn't work. It didn't work for you, and you are a college-educated adult. So how is it going to work for them? That started the process of not having homework unless they don't get something done. And by the time I left, I would say the majority of our teachers didn't give homework unless it was just something they didn't get done. Influences of pop culture. And so we wouldn't stick our heads in the sand as things would come out. We look at how can we use that as learning opportunities? How do we use that to reach our kids? So whether it was Disney Pixar's Inside Out, the 13 Reasons Why, to now the Dear Evan Hansen movie. We use those pieces to have conversations with students to meet them where they are. I've already talked about the human and sex trafficking and how we had to train based on the situation that we were in, understanding that we were never content to stay where we are. And we had a professional development menu. As we started to grow in this, like I said, where we had trauma training for new hires, whether you were a cook, custodian, or teacher, that happened, we started creating that menu of options, and it was consistent. And they knew every summer that these opportunities were going to be there. Principals understood what they could request, and we would continue to expand, refine, and grow in those areas. So calming spaces. You say all that to get to this point of calming spaces do not work in and of themselves. They are a piece of a greater philosophy. They are one piece of promoting self-regulation in this bigger idea of trauma-informed care. So if your school has nothing but a calming space, you are not going to see the data that I have spouted off to you. You're just not. Because it is a holistic idea of looking at the whole child. Our calming spaces took, took, took a trip, okay? The first thing in which we were kind of inspired is we had gone to the West Virginia Schools for the Deaf and Blind in Romney, West Virginia. We had gone because my low incidence population was one of my lowest achieving groups in my county and I felt that part of it was we weren't pulling from the resources that were readily available to us. I had a great relationship with their director at the time and I said, hey, can I just bring my people up for like two days 
and we can shadow, we can learn, show us what we know, and we can make some changes to what we're doing. We're like, sure. So we went up to the Romney campus, and they did. They shadowed, they learned, they looked at low incidence, plus, um, low incidence disabilities. But the one thing that I was just like, shut the front door, was when they took us into their MSP program. Now, at that point in time, the, the campus had three separate schools. They had the blind school, the deaf school, and then their multi-sensory disability school, which meant they, were, they had a low incidence, blind, low vision, deaf, hard of hearing, with something else. And it might have been autism and intellectual disability, but they were the much more severe kids. They typically had a population in that school between eight and 12, okay, but it was super intensive for that group of kids. And they had this room that was set up in which each child had a separate area that was designed for them. On the wall was their name with the list of things that they liked and the way that they liked them, their communication mode, and what were their typical triggers to come in there. Also with the approximate time that it was going to take them to self-regulate and then go back out. So the first thing I'm doing, I'm standing there and I'm like, And then I want to play with all the toys. Then a kid comes in. And so like I'm backing up because I don't want to interfere with what's going on. And I watch a child who has zero verbal language, uses a textbook to communicate, um, had autism and was blind or low vision, and went to their space, requested what they needed, got what they needed, there was a timer, I watched them calm down and then go back to class. And I was like, what? To which I looked at the director and I went, explain this to me. And so they went through that, that they worked on the idea of self-regulation. When kids were calm, they exposed them to the different equipments that they had. They would choose what they liked. The timing was continual based on practice, essentially, and that kids could either request or they could be removed there if the behavior was severe enough. But once they were there, it was a process, and then they returned to class, and I was amazed. And I came back, and I, looked, I said, we're gonna build one of these things. And they were like, where? I said, I don't know yet. And they were like, how? And I'm like, I don't know yet, but we're gonna do this. And so at the time, I had a really good relationship with the principal at West Hamlin Elementary, which had probably one of our most significant populations. It was on the border of Cabell County, and so we got a lot of foster kids and transfers in from Cabell County. It had um, one of our severe and profound teachers, so we had that population, and it had gone from a school of excellence to one of the worst test scores in the county. So I went to him and I said, hey, can I have a space, because I have an idea. And I told him I had a proper idea, and he was like, well, I can give you like where I keep the Christmas tree. Like, I guess I can move the Christmas tree, and I'll give you this space. I mean, at this point, if you tell me it might help, I'm willing to try anything. And I was like, awesome. And so we did. From that, he then was super excited. So he's telling people at principal's meetings. And so Ranger Elementary's like, hey, I've got an old nurse's office. Can you build this place for me? And I'm like, sure. So then, and as we go, we went to Hearts, to Hamlin, Guy Valley, Midway, Lincoln County High School, which had two spaces. And then we had a remote learning center. And so the remote learning center came from, uh, during the time of COVID, uh, part of what I oversaw was school health. And I, I knew that IDEA had zero waivers that the ability to give face-to-face -face instruction was going to have to occur no matter what happened. So how am I gonna do that if they close a the school? So um, that board office was in the old Career and Technical Center. There was a room that used to be used for wrestling that still had mats in it. And so I kind of took it over. And I took out the mats and I built a remote learning center that had several different cubicles where kids could come in for face-to-face -face instruction even if their schools were shut down and I built a common space in the side, inside of that room. So the only tool that's not on there is the school that I referenced before that I said still had restraints and still had extensive behavioral issues. 
all the schools that got on board saw their behavior and number of restraints decrease. So like I said, we went to West Virginia School for the Deaf and Blind first, and that's where that inspiration came from. What was really specific there is the data piece. So you could tell by the sheet that was there with the child's name, their preferred, the amount of time it was probably going to take them, that data was a key piece. That this just couldn't be used without a data piece. Now, for kids that may need it sporadically for self-regulation, you may or may not have a lot of data on that child. But some children are gonna use it more than others. And that data was gonna be your key to making this work. And so we kept that in the back of our heads that data was going to have to drive this strategy. Now, as I keep talking, it's gonna be the proverbial we, okay? Because I didn't do this on my own. I had a great and awesome team that built these with me, that trained with me, that checked in with me, that continued to do that, okay? Um, so when you hear we, although I am not still in Lincoln County, that was my team. And they deserve as much, if not more credit, because they went along with the crazy harebrained ideas that I always had. And he's one of them. Like, he'll still travel with me at times. I know, they're crazy, I know, I know. And so that idea of that same we is that there has to be a team, okay? As administrators, you've got teacher leaders that are ready to do this with you. Have your team, okay? It gets tiring as an administrator. You carry everything. Right now you carry COVID, you carry test scores, you carry the social emotional needs of your students, you're carrying the community trauma of COVID, you carry whatever home and personal life you still have because that's still important. You cannot do this by yourself. You have to have your team. And so when you find that, work with that. So we built by Samlin first. We learned a lot. There were things that we did in this room that we didn't do again because we learned it didn't work. So one of the first things that I, I learned that did not work is that do not make your own light covers. That's bad. Just buy them. School specialty sells them. They are rated for the fire marshal. They send you the paper that you can print out and put in your notebook that you have to have for the fire marshal. So there's no questions. Do not make them. Next thing was we used coverings like curtains for the walls to darken them. Don't do that either. The fire marshal doesn't like that. Just paint it. Okay. Now cinder block paint is not fun. Maintenance never painted for me because they still thought I was a little crazy. I paint it. Okay. Um, and doing that, I learned which paint worked and didn't work. Okay. They do have to meet certain specifications. But painting was a whole lot easier than ever doing those wall coverings ever again. There were some things that we definitely established that we used all of the time. One of them was flooring. We used that rubberized, put together, like gym garage flooring that you can get at Walmart. Okay, now we ordered them from Quill because we would order it in bulk, and they would just click together, and then we could trim them a lot easier. We did that for a couple of reasons. One, it was easy to clean. Two, when a child goes in to self-regulate, they will self-regulate, okay? You're in that room because seclusion is illegal in West Virginia, but they're going to self-regulate, which means they may want to be on the floor. They may want to kick on the floor. Linoleum hurts. That rubberized flooring does not hurt. And so that was something that we used everywhere. Um, like I said, we learned do not make your own light covers. We're going to use them from school specialty. One thing that we also did from school specialty because of those light covers, is we started ordering them and keeping them in the office because more and more teachers have started to take them because fluorescent lights hurt, okay? You don't realize how much they hurt and give you that dull headache until you don't have it anymore. And so we started, teachers started asking for these light covers, so we kept them in a variety of colors, including whisper white, um, and so they were just available. That also provided some consistency across calming spaces to the classroom. And then if there was something in the, in the calming space that teachers wanted to use in their classroom that was appropriate, so like not the flooring, we can't paint their walls super dark, but we can use fidgets, we can use cues, we can use light covers, we would get that for them because 
the more that they could make their space better and more comfortable, the better that they, that they could do. Come and take a wild guess, you three are much more comfortable than all of you right now. Okay? Not picking on you, when you started, you weren't fidgeting at all. And now you don't stop moving. And you're not real comfortable, are you? No. Okay? Neither are our kids. All right? So the more that we could connect things that worked in the calming space to the classroom, we made that appropriate and made that, made that work. There was seating, manipulatives, and a lane surface that then became very much standard across all of our spaces. And so even though a lot of things we learned how to either buy in bulk or go a route that wasn't going to cost an arm and a leg, um, there were some things that then were very consistent. Lighting makes a huge difference. Um, the picture I can see on my screen is very different than the picture that you can actually see. Um, but some of the lighting that we use, um, one was a fiber optic kind of like fan, um, and one was a projector that then can project different colors and lights um, on the scene. And so when we found things that worked really across populations, we made sure that we made that consistent across all spaces. We also remembered that our kids were pretty transient, um, that kids that might be at hearts one day, something might happen and they might show up at midway the next. So even though each space was slightly different based on the space or the need of that school, there were some things that we tried to make very consistent. So if a child was transient, that if they used that space in both schools, they, uh, there was a comfortableness to that. <clears throat> so Hearts PK-8 was the first room that we actually seen. So um, when we went to build Hearts, we had built West Hamlin and Ranger at that point in time. And Ranger mirrored, for the most part, what West Hamlin looked like, because it was the second room. <clears throat> when we had Hearts, we had a, a little different of a setup and so we had some opportunities to add some things that we couldn't do in the other rooms. And then we realized that saying, hey, I wanna to go to a calming space might provide some stigma. But if I themed it, then it may take that away. So at heart, that was our first name when we themed it outer space. So like, I need to go to outer space. And we thought that, that probably might sound less stigmatizing to children if they needed to request that to go. Um, and so we worked with a theme across what we were doing in that room. Now, at Hearts, that room was an actual classroom size. So Hearts was actually one of um, the schools that was built during the time that Lincoln County had a takeover and they had some buildings that had to be rebuilt, including the consolidation of Fort High School. So when that one was built, there were a couple of rooms that were about this size, that then they built dividers in the middle to make classrooms. And so this was actually a spare classroom. So we actually had the entire classroom size. And so we had a ball pit that we could use. And one of the students that we currently had at Hearts at that time had used a ball pit when he was younger that really allowed for calming. He, had, he was nonverbal um, and had autism. And so we're like, why don't we just take that up there and we will use that and we'll see if that helps other kids as well. Because as he got older, the ball pit then wasn't an option because he was in other classrooms that weren't set up like PK classrooms where you can have a ball pit. So we put that in there. Um, and each time that we added something, we reminded ourselves that training had to occur if something was new. So like we had a training video of how to clean and sanitize the ball pit. So we wanted to show them how that they would do that. To tie in um, the theme, you can kind of see at the top that we had the inflatable planets that were uh, hung from, from the ceiling. And one thing I need to point out is that you do see a roller in the lower left-hand side, because that was the size of a classroom, we had two pieces of therapeutic equipment in there that we had for kids that were more severe, because that was also the space that our OT could use. And so that was where she used that. No other room had therapeutic equipment in it because it's not a therapy room, okay? When we use the term calming space, because that can be a general education intervention, when you use the term sensory room, that typically has to be overseen by like an OT because you're using therapeutic equipment or therapies outlined in a program. 
And so, you know, where does that line draw between therapy and interventions? And so I did need to point that out. Also in this room, you get a really good picture of a lane service. So there are two things in there that was chosen specifically to protect. One was the lane service. Okay, so sometimes kids need to lay down and take a nap. Because think about a child who has, let's say, been exposed to a domestic violence event the night before. Where are they going to be the next day? They're going to be in school. So what are we going to do? If I can even let them take a nap for two hours and they can have all afternoon to learn, that's going to be better than if I fight with them all day. Because if they don't take a nap, they will not learn. You're going to have a fight. You're going to have somebody dedicated to deal with them all day long. And they're not going to get anything done. But if I understand they've had a traumatic event, they're telling me they're tired, I can let them take a nap, that's an appropriate place for them to take a nap. It is, it, we would only purchase it from a medical supply company. Okay, We were not going to have it look like we had a bed in a common space. It's a therapeutic service purchased from a medical supply company with a 1,000 pound grade that can easily be wiped clean. At the same time, there was also a 24 hour continual recording night vision camera that was placed in every common space. Now, based on the law that was enacted that then went into effect last fall, this fall, last, last, last fall, fall, I lose time with COVID. <laughs> like, I don't know if it's just you, like just me, or if you guys do it too, and I'm like, that one, two, what? Like, count in your head, because lose time. Um, we already had cameras in these spaces. Um, this fits in a gray area in that wall. I would say make sure the cameras are in there um, because that protects you as well. Because typically you're gonna have a one-on-one -on -one with a child in this space. If you have a continual camera that's there, I, then you always have that protection of that video. She's breathing, she'll call you back. Now, um, this was also very low to the ground. So it came up to about my knee. So even a preschooler could climb up on it on their own, and if they needed to lay down, they could. Um, I remember one of the children that would utilize that a lot had a very tumultuous home life. And the only reason he wasn't taken from his home, one is because there was no place to send him because we have a foster care crisis in West Virginia, as well as his dad was a known violent drug dealer that no one in that county wanted to go to their home. Yes. In the, in the following room, do you just have one student at a time or? Yes, typically. And, and the question always is, what if you have two? Um, and funny enough, I never had that. Even if I had somebody like coming, typically if I had somebody coming in with somebody else, the other child had calmed down enough that you could transition back out. We actually never faced needing the space for two. Um, but one thing that we talked like to tie into, the more that we could connect things within classrooms, having calming corners, flexible seating, lighting, the need to remove out was then less. So the more classrooms I had that had that welcoming, calming effect, the less likely I needed sole use of that space. And so um, here's a couple more pictures of, of parts to kind of show we have multiple things. You can see the inflatable balls to sit in, the big Joes. There's plenty of space for them to move throughout the room. So every time furniture is chosen, it's chosen for that specific space. Um, although there were things that we wanted to have in each space, if we had to make a decision, we had to make a decision based on space because it can't be cramped. We want to make sure that they can move freely within it. We also made sure that phones were in every classroom or every calming space um, because in Lincoln County, only half the schools have cell service and that's even pretty sloppy. So we wanted to make sure that if something would go wrong if they needed extra assistance, if they needed to tap out, that they had the ability to call out without having to leave the room themselves. So we made sure that phones were installed in every space and the reason that's so specific to say that is because we used the spaces we were given 
and typically we were reforming old storage closets. Okay, now storage closets are large in schools. Okay, so it's not like it was this big, but typically we were we were given space that they could not utilize for instruction, and so we had to make sure that then maintenance was coming in and install things. A couple other pieces that were typical um, is the glider with the ottoman, and we would purchase those at Walmart or Target. Um, they're in the nursery section. They actually are really solidly built. The cushions um, are, you can throw them in the washing machine and they snap off. And so we made sure that it could be wiped down or it could be washed. Um, and then we had area rugs in most places um, that allowed them, you know, they're gonna sit and read a story necessarily um, that gives them a separate place and just that rubberized flooring to sit as well as we had storage containers that were those Sterlite plastic containers. One, because they're pretty indestructible. So if you had a little kid throwing a fit, they're probably not gonna be able to break it. Um, it stores things really well. And if by chance it does get broken, they're super cheap to replace. Guy Valley Middle School was the first build that we did that was solely on a secondary programmatic level. Um, now this room actually had to re be rebuilt upstairs because it was built um, in Guyon Valley, which was previously a high school. It was built in the 1920s. We used um, in the basement across from the cafeteria for the space that we originally had. And the um, aqueduct system completely failed and the entire basement completely flooded. And so we had to relocate that upstairs. But we're keeping the kind of picture to talk about what is here, mainly because of how you have to adjust to that space and you can really make it work. Um, it was the, the biggest room we had yet to build. It did present some, some challenges. Um, the windows were old. They, uh, we couldn't really use typical um, kind of window coverings on that because behind the shower curtains are metal bars. So we wanted to make sure that they um, were covered and there felt like there was a space so that kids wouldn't go after them. And so those are actually shower curtains and so they kind of have that fold within them that connect that space. And we had the old types of lights. So different than the, the lights that are kind of inlaid like you see here, those were the old hanging lights. And so we realized that the light covers actually work on them too once we figured out how to hook them up. Um, and so we really had to adapt to that space, but we wanted to make sure that it worked. Um, and so each time that you, we went into something, there was typically a day of cleaning out, because there were storage areas, um, wiping things down, sometimes cleaning things I never want to see again painting that room, laying that flooring, and then the second day is putting it all together. Um, and, and understanding that nothing happened that we couldn't find a solution to. So every time we would go in to a school to build a room, the idea was when we leave here, they will have a common space. Every possible problem has a solution, we just have to figure it out. We would always go beforehand and see the space that they are going to let us have, make notes of what we're gonna to have to do to prep the room, and then plan it out specifically for the needs of programmatic level of that school. Like I said, Guy Mallet was the first one that was purely secondary. So we started thinking about what would older kids might need within a common space that younger kids might not need. And so we built like a counseling homework plan, made sure that there was a Wi-Fi spot in the room so that they could pull down um, the internet if they needed it, make sure that we had plenty of electrical like hookups, that if they needed a laptop um, or to charge an iPad, that they could do so. And, um, and so are there any other safety considerations that we have to do that to take care of and thinking about possible situations? Now this QR code, and I want to bring up the website in a second, it's going to take you to a sway that breaks down common spaces and the things that you need to build it, things that you need to consider, different um, links 
to different places on where you can grab things so that if you do revisit and want to build the space as part of a bigger idea of being trauma-informed, that you can go step-by-step step in doing that. So that website Pittsburgh made national headlines for having calming spaces in their schools two years after we built our first one. Um, but they were the first ones to really get national attention. So showing that this isn't just something being done here in West Virginia, that it's a practice that's being done across the United States. You need to review the age study and its impact with your staff. That is also linked here. Like we said, if, if it can work in Lincoln County, that is ground zero with the highest NASH rate per nation, it can work anywhere if you want it to. Um, if you have the people that are going to, to make this work. So one of the things that is linked here is the Calming Spaces presentation that Adina actually saw. Um, and so if you want to use that as a training video for your staff, feel free. It's linked there. There is a passcode to it because Celebrating Connections has it on their own platform and so the passcode is there. And um, if for some reason that ceases to work, let me know um, because I will promise that it will continue to work. But then that presentation is there and you can use that. So it goes through the steps of what you need to do by the room and equipment. Um, so it goes kind of step by step on how you need to plan and build that room. Um, as you can see, there are links here that are going to take you to different places to order materials. So um, these links right here take you to the white covers that school specialty um, has. This link will take you to where you can purchase the flooring through Quill. Whether or not you theme it is up to you and there's a note about theming. Taking care of equipment and furniture, linking where we got the lane surface, as well as the glider, where you can get storage and cleaning supplies, a brief um, overview about therapy equipment and whether or not you can use them in those spaces, um, programmatic level, and then supplies. So there's also another brief training video um, about calming spaces in homes and classrooms and how to adapt these spaces to that area. It's about 15 minutes, so it's super short. And that you can also use if you are trying to also connect to have a space with what can be done in the classrooms. Um, and that video has tons of hands-on, you know, showing different <laughs> activities, things that you can make or things that you can show. And then that goes through the different types of supplies that you can have. And then just some final things that you need to make sure that you do that we're getting ready to cover just as a review. So that, that calming space, like that, this website, you will be able to access at any point in time with that QR code. There are no mistakes, only lessons. You will make mistakes in this journey. If you choose to embark on it, <laughs> you have permission, if you choose to accept it, you're going to make mistakes. There are times you're gonna reflect and go, we could have done this, we should have done this, and that's okay. You're not going to be perfect. But if you continue to reflect and revise, that's what you need to do. Um, some of these we've talked about already, kind of like our, our wall coverings. We're not gonna make light covers on our own anymore. Um, we decided that we wanted to try out a plasma globe. Okay, we thought that that would be super cool. Like when you go to Cosign, you put your hand on the plasma globe and it does the sound. Well, like that might sound cool, but don't do that. Super thin glass. It's gonna break. Don't, 
Okay, things that are inherently glass don't have. We learned that. Like, we thought it'd be okay. Nope. Um, we tried to order things from um, different companies on the internet. That really wasn't a great idea sometimes. Um, if you go outside of the United States, they don't have the same regulations we do. Sometimes you can't return things. Um, although that we're gonna talk a little bit about cost saving options and how you can do this on a, a budget because there's administrators who don't have unlimited funds. Um, there are some things not worth it. And so we didn't order any more fiber optics from China. In our first build, we thought it would look super cool if we put those glow in the dark stars on the ceiling. No, they fall off and they do not work. So like two hours of time, like putting these stars on the ceiling that were like, you'll make them think that they're like laying out the stars. No, it didn't. Okay. Um, and so we just didn't do it again. Um, and, and we had one time we put those sticky dots on those walls at parties and we found that all of them within like a little kid's like ability to do this or adult's ability to do this. Yeah, not down there. You've got to make them up high. And that's okay too. All right, so there, we learn things sometimes that we aren't going to do again. And that's okay. The same way that I would always tell my staff, you're either going to learn things that you want to do that I tell you, or you're going to learn things you never want to do again that I tell you. Either way, you've learned something. And that's okay. And in building these rooms, that's okay too. Lincoln County doesn't have massive amounts of money. Okay. Um, our, our coal companies went out in the 1980s. So we were 40 years without having good money. So it's not like I had this plethora of money to build these rooms. So one thing that I did from my position is I looked at making sure I was buying things with purpose overall. And then how can I do this on a budget? You can order a calming space from several therapy catalogs. And the cheapest one is about $10,000. The rooms that we built, all in all, totaled about 2,500, with the lane surface and the night vision camera being the most expensive. The night vision camera costs around $500, the lane surface costs $900, so we really built the rest of those rooms for about a thousand. And that I could find. I could find that within budgets. That I could do. So one is paint versus wall coverings. One, the fire marshal likes it better. It's also cheaper. And if I knew I was going to build three rooms in a fairly good succession, I bought three rooms worth of paint at the same time because like Lowe's typically would give me a rebate. So that helped, okay? Um, I looked at the ability of, of how can I do this and save some money. Also bought in bulk. So if I'm going to buy fidgets for a calming space, I did it at the same time that I was buying fidgets to replace the fidget boxes for my teachers. And so I bought in bulk from Oriental Trading. That made that price lower as well. The surprising shopping options is always the fun part of talking about calming spaces. So we talked about that later. Okay, that light laser that would shine different types of light all the way across, across the ceiling. And um, that laser from school specialty was around $250. Amazingly enough, I found it at Spencer's for 70. <laughs> so Spencer's also took the tax exempt form and my P card. So I went and bought five of them. <laughs> my most favorite day of employment is when I went to the purchasing coordinator and handed her the receipt from Spencer's. <laughs> it was priceless. <laughs> And she was like, I don't think we can pay this. I was like, it's a laser light. And she was like, I don't think we can pay this. And I was like, I saved you like $200 a laser. She was like, I just, I just, I just, it's great. But it's okay. Oriental Trading actually is a great place to buy fidgets. Um, and so if I could buy them from there, um, for the most part, then I was able to coordinate larger purchases to help more kids. Um, there were some fidgets that I spent more money on from different places. Either there was a specific need for a student or I wanted a specific quality of something. Um, but if I did my kind of run of the mill fidgets that any kid could use from Oriental Trading, that let me have some extra money to do some more expensive manipulatives. Shower curtains are a great wall covering. Um, like we showed you in the aquarium at Nine Valley, and we use that to cover up those walls. 
that is much less expensive than trying to figure out a separate wall covering. If you have ever Googled wall coverings to try to figure out how much those cost, those are hundreds of dollars. My shower curtain was $3.99, Dollar General. That also takes tax exempt for. So thinking outside of the box in that way really helped cut down on the price of those rings. And I did the work myself. I didn't contract out somebody to do it, and I didn't pay them overtime. I did it myself. Now, like I said, I had a great team that was willing to jump in and do that with me. Um, but yes, the director had on paint clothes and screwed together a therapy table and spent the time to, to build that. And so I didn't also have overhead of paying overtime for another employee to do that work. There are must-haves. There are some things that you have to have, um, one, to protect yourself, protect your school, and to protect your students. Um, one is you need a point of contact, okay? So if you don't have a trauma team at your school, do you have a positive behavior support team at your school? Do you have counselors, social workers? You need a point of contact to oversee this calming space because there are upkeep that has to occur. They need to make sure that the cleaning supplies are there. They, um, one thing that we had with our um, social workers that took that point of contact in at the schools is they would go in once a week and make sure the cleaning supplies were well stocked, took note of anything that was damaged or might need to be replaced, um, double check the data notebook, make sure people were signing in and signing out. And if they needed support in checking in with that, they let us know. You wanna have buy-in, okay? It, you can have this great room, but if they don't use it, it serves no purpose. So your buy-in comes from a bigger picture that we've talked about throughout today. Um, and like I said, put your time in this 10% that's gonna do it. That 80% is gonna come along. And then when you have that 80% that come along makes that 90%, you even get a little couple of your 10% over here that never wanna do anything because all of a sudden, They've got all the trouble and life is good and they want to know why life is good. So make sure that you're focusing over here on the people that are going to get in and do the work. Make that buy in. Um, we had to invest in some tools, okay? Um, like we had to get a drill to, to, to put together the glider and to put together the lane surface. We had to have cleaning supplies. Um, and so when we thought about building these rooms, we made sure we had something that would last and that could be used continually um, and not something that we would spend money and throw away because after building a couple of rooms, that was no longer cost effective. You wanna make sure you have safeguards in place. So that's things like having that night vision camera. You have your policies and procedures. So um, sometimes, because we would have to coordinate with technology and maintenance to get that camera built, that room might be built minus that camera for a couple of weeks. And so if that camera was not up and running, it was a two adult job if a, a child needed to go in there. Um, and so do you have policies and procedures in using that room? Are the people that are utilizing that room trained in de-escalation? Are they trained in restraint? Now we've never had to restrain a child in a common space because they can't hurt anything. You can deflect, that's not a restraint. And they, it, it's designed for them not to be able to destroy anything. Now, CPI, you don't restrain for property destruction, okay? But some people, if they go to throw chairs, they don't see it as property destruction. They see it as a danger to self and others. There's nothing that they can do in there, okay? Um, so are the people utilizing your room, are they trained in de-escalation? Are they trained um, and restraint. Do they understand adult SEL or do they have those adult behavioral decision making skills? They understand that they can only control themselves and that they aren't going to self regulate this child. The child is going to self regulate. So, are they also trained in the different pieces of equipment and supplies in that room so that they can assist if a child wants to use something? Okay, like one thing that we have in there, we have CD players with instrumental music. So there's calming. Sometimes a kid would want something specific. Do they know how to assist if the child can't do it by themselves? But do they understand those principles of adult SEL where the child will self-regulate, they're there for supervision. 
And do you have that continual training to compensate for your staff overturning? Okay, everybody has staff overturn. Whether by retirement or leaving, you're gonna have new staff. So do you have it in place to train them on this space every year? And do you have a way for them to request more training if needed? Let's say that you have a child that requires aid support and they're utilizing this room and then that aid transfers out. Do you have a way to train that new aid on not just the procedures of that room, but those procedures for that specific child? That then comes in to the data piece. Data drives everything, but only good use of data should drive everything. We can make data say anything we want it to. Are you using it appropriately? So one of the things that we had is we had a data notebook in every single room that recorded the date, the time they got in, the time that they left, the student, the adult that accompanied them, what happened? Like, what was the behavior that required this removal to the common space? And sometimes it would say, child requested. That's fine, that's a behavior that requested this use. What did they use and what notes do you have? Because once you have the use, you're gonna see two types of patterns. You're either gonna see student use pattern or you're gonna have overall patterns. Both of those are valuable. Okay, so overall pattern helped us define what are the things that we want in every single space. Student use patterns helped us refine behavior and crisis plans and IEP goals. So you use this as a programmatic standpoint as well as a student standpoint. Also, can you tell by this use as well as a part of a bigger picture, can you tie this to student outcomes? So there were a number of outcomes that I looked at when we had this light bulb moment of we got to do something different that I would track every single year. And I knew based on training, based on information from staff, based on IEPs, what, what their level of implementation was. I had some schools that were awesome. I had some schools not so awesome. And their student outcomes reflected that. Outcomes that I would track specifically was students. I looked at the number of behavioral referrals per student. Okay, so if Johnny is somebody that had a lot of behavioral referrals and we start using this as part of self-regulation and his behavioral referrals go down, then I'm going to look at that in a larger picture of a possible correlation. I'm also going to look at time on task, either by student or by class as well as achievement data per student. I am not a proponent of looking at achievement data of third grade this year to third grade next year. There's two different groups of kids. If I'm gonna look at third grade this year, I'm looking at fourth grade next year and fifth grade the year after that. So when I look at achievement data, I'm looking at student specific and class specific achievement data. And I'm very, kind of focused in, even when I choose class, what is the percentage of transient population? Why did I also look at that? Because two years ago, I, I was running some data and I found that I had a percentage jump in special education percentage, which was odd to me. I was like, well, now wait a second. So I pulled it and it was because I had 90 transfers on the first day of school and 80 of them had IEP. That wasn't me. And so when I knew to look there, I could then account for that change of my data. At school levels, I looked at their number of suspensions. And the reason I didn't put expulsions there was after this became a county-wide thing, I had expulsions from one school and one school only, the one that didn't want me in there. I had expulsions my first two and a half years and then I didn't have another expulsion hearing. I looked at discipline referrals per school. Like I said, our high school discipline referrals got cut in half when we did this as part 
as a bigger picture. Okay, and part of that bigger picture was trauma-informed care, adult relationships and behavior, as well as a big push of you can be CTE and college prep ready. But if you chose college, that didn't mean we couldn't do CTE with you. And then I also looked at qualitative data for school. What are my teachers telling me? Okay, qualitative data by its own recent research, and although it's standing alone may not If my teachers believe it's working, it will work. So what are they telling me? And then overall in the district, I looked at special education referrals, special education percentages, indicator four, and significant disproportionality. So for you all, what indicator four and significant disproportionality is, is that there are a set of indicators that every district has to report to the state and the state has to report to the feds. That is what ensures us getting our federal funding specifically through IDEA. And indicator four looks at the percentage of students with disabilities that have exclusionary discipline, suspension or expulsion, compared to their non-identified peers. And then 4B looks at exclusionary discipline based on seven racial and ethnic categories. Significant disproportionality is a three-year cycle that looks at exclusionary discipline, placement, and identification separated by race and ethnicity, okay? Um, if you are identified as a district that has an issue with indicator four, all it basically really has to do is write an approval letter. If you're identified for significant disproportionality, 15% of your federal funding has to go into focusing in decreasing that disproportionality. And so I would also look at my data that would feed those two, two pieces of information that would go to the feds. And in looking at all of this, I also looked at my number of due processes, lawsuits, mediations, or complaints. And from the time that we started, so what I'll say is what we started, if I inherited anything, not so much, we had to clean that up. We had zero due processes, we had zero mediations, and we had one complaint. So the more that we worked together, the better it was for the student, the teacher, the school, and the district. Success took many forms, okay? We talked about those outcomes that we can look at, but we also look at qualitative data. And success for one child is success. So have you all heard that starfish story where a man on the beach is walking, he throws the starfish in one by one, and someone's like, why are you doing that? There are thousands of starfish in that beach. You can't possibly make a difference. And he said, I made a difference to that one. So success, even with one student, is success. Out of our first build at West Hamlet, when we built that, we had a specific student in mind because he was being sent home every week, sometimes multiple times a week, okay? Because he would, he had autism, he was fairly nonverbal, um, and when he would get angry and start to escalate, there was no coming back down and he would become very violent. So we wanted him to be able to stay in school. That's the goal. I need this kid to stay in school. And they started using this calming space and we watched the data log, okay? So he's in there. And like the first time he was in there for like two hours, all right, but he didn't go home. We watched the data log and eventually we saw like huge letters. They're like, it worked. They finally found what he liked to self-regulate. And from that time on, he didn't go home anymore. He was in school all day. He started requesting to go to the space when he would get upset. Now, because he had a few words, okay, he was fairly nonverbal, but he had a few words. And he, he would go, my space, my space. And so that was our cue to take him out. And he would go, he would do what he needed to do, and he would come back to class. And he ceased to be sent home. We had a student that was placed into foster care. And for about this tall, she could wreak some havoc in a classroom. And I'm talking like, could overturn desks and make things, whew, she buddy. So we started first by taking her to that space when she wasn't hungry. 
with the same adult and ended up being her speech therapist was the person that we needed in this one. And so she would take her there in the morning, put her to the ground, play it, okay? Time to go to class. If you are upset, if you do this, Miss Teresa will come get you and take you there. And so that then became the cue. And the day she went a lot. At Miss Teresa, when she was in there, started working with her in her language of why she was so angry. She was so angry because she wanted to go home. She didn't want to be where she was at. She wanted to be with her mom. And so she started working on that language of why she was angry, why someone made her angry. Well, because they came in saying their mom made them pancakes this morning and I don't get pancakes. Guess what? She has every right to be mad. But she doesn't get pancakes from her mom. Because adults should do better. They should. But the more that they worked with her, the more then she could recognize why she was angry. She could remove, oh, my heart tells me that doesn't work. It took about a year and a half for her not to use that room pretty much at all. But that's a whole lot better than a year, year and a half of flipping that. We had a student who legitimately was the boy where he followed. Um, he came to us when he was six years old, um, did not wear clothes until he came to us, and that was an issue in and of itself, um, had zero language, environmental deprivation beyond all We started like
starting point to say we need to do this, but there is an acceptance that we've always needed to do this. It does start though for a problem um, when we have to go virtual because we no longer have everything at our disposal. Okay, overnight we all had to figure out this virtual life and we're still figuring it out. But we can still promote self-regulation and common spaces online just as well as we can do brick and mortar. So brick and mortar, we need to talk about all of those pieces in creating those common spaces. But what happens when we have to go online? What do we do? If we go online and we still don't focus on the social emotional needs of our students, we will fail. Okay, we have to still do that. How can we do that? We can have virtual common spaces. And the things that we have to look at, one is choosing a platform. Um, we have Sway readily available to us. It's Microsoft 365. You also have Padlet. You also have Weebly. And you also have other things that can be available to use that are completely free. You want to make sure things are accessible. Okay. That's one reason that we really promote Microsoft 365 is because the State Department paid for the good stuff. The stuff that is on Microsoft 365 is accessible, so you don't have to worry about that element. You want to make sure that you have taken into account legal and safety considerations, um, as well as then choosing your content. And so this QR code is going to take you to a, a way to build your own virtual common space, either for your classroom, for your school, or for your district. So that QR code is going to take you here. Um, and this tablet is not a virtual common space. Okay? It is a, here's how you build your virtual common space. There's way too much on here to be calling. It is not, in fact, right? But it goes through the different elements that you can choose because you want it to, to fit your intention and your audience, okay? Now, one thing we talked about is legal and safety considerations. You want to have a disclaimer there. You want to have the text for the National Suicide Hotline. You can make that very specific to your district. Some <coughs> counties have specific help hotlines that other counties don't have. You want to make that available. Some districts have, um, like we, one thing that we faced in Lincoln County during COVID um, was a death of a teacher um, who was also a soccer coach. And so we set up a 24, 24 hour crisis hotline to which when it called, it went to the crisis response team. So it wasn't our phone number, but it rang into our phones. We were home like everybody else. Um, but it was made 24 hours a day and had a schedule set up that if it ran from this time to this time, this person had it. If it ran from this time to this time, this person had it. And so if you have something like that, you can add that to your virtual common space as well. That wouldn't be like a national hotline. But you want to have that disclaimer on there as well. And then you're able to have what fits. Okay? And so each of the categories on this tablet are different elements of calming activities, but you only want to pick like a selection, okay? You don't need everything. One thing that is also pretty cool about a virtual common space is you can change it up, okay? So either based on feedback, based on the number of clicks, or just you want to change with the seasons or the month, you can change things up. And so what is here are all free um, open source links of calming activities. That include audiobooks, exercise and yoga, journaling. Now, one of my favorite is live animal cams that go to the zoo. Um, puzzles and games. They found, they did a, um, a survey that 20 minutes of playing what's called like a mindless game, so things like Bejeweled and Beauty Crush, actually allow you to refocus better because it allows your mind to go expand and come back in. And so there are puzzles and games. If you use tablets in your district or your school or your classroom. We kind of put the kind of top 10 um, anxiety apps of 2021 20, um, that are available. Music, virtual field trip, Google relaxation. Um, and then there is a column of recommendations. 
kind of like six steps we need to build your virtual common space. And then we have some examples of virtual common spaces here. So if you want to see how other districts, other states um, have built that, you can look there and see what they've done.